Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, no technical problems. Um, welcome to another of the BOFAS Lectures of Distinction. This is number 11. And tonight we'll be talking about uh, paediatric foot problems. My name is Graham Tudor. I am a foot and ankle specialist up in the northeast of England, where we have very narrowly avoided um, further lockdown, thankfully. Um, as usual, between we're going to have two talks tonight. Uh, between the talks, you'll have a chance to uh, ask questions, and at the end, we'll have a longer chance to answer any further questions. So please, um, as usual, submit your questions at the little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, um, and we will endeavour to answer them as best we can. So we have two very eminent uh, foot and ankle specialists tonight, Mr Alpesh Katari and Mr Rick Brown, who have several years of experience between them, um, and they will divide paediatric paediatric foot problems into two uh, big groups. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Alpesh. And uh, as I said before, keep the questions coming, please. Right, thanks for that. Um, okay, we should be good to go. Uh, so welcome everyone. And thanks for inviting uh, me, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, to join uh, both us this evening and it's great to participate. Okay, so the brief was in 30 minutes for chat and then 30 minutes for uh, further discussion, we need to cover pediatric foot and ankle. That is a fair amount. And, you know, we're not really going to cover things, uh, all those things in such a short period of time. So uh, Mr. Brown and I have split it into two broad groups, things affecting or you'll see presenting in a younger child and then things presenting in an older child. I'll be focusing on the younger child this evening. And this really outlines my learning objective. So we're gonna spend most of the time discussing club foot. You need to know a fair amount of this and you're likely to be asked about this in your uh, pediatric section in your exam. Um, and this PEDS is one thing that people commonly fail on in the exam and uh, hopefully there'll be no excuse to fail on clubfoot in your exam after this session. We'll discuss a bit about congenital vertical talus and then the rest there, just a slide on a few topics just to cover some bases uh, which might be useful for you in the exam. So starting with clubfoot, this is a really good resource and I would recommend you have a read of this. It's got loads of information about clubfoot and it also puts it in the global perspective, uh, which is, is, is quite good uh, to look at. It's also available in 30 languages if um, revising for the FRCS isn't hard enough as it is. In an exam situation, you might get given a picture to begin with, a clinical photograph. And so you might have one of a club foot. So the first thing you'll need to do is describe what you see. And this, these series of, of photos will highlight the deformities that you see in club foot. And this is the acronym you need to remember, CAVE. So you have the CAVUS, um, of, and you have the forefoot adductus, the hindfoot varus, and the equinus, and that's illustrated in these pictures. This is an important acronym because not only does it tell you what the deformities are, if you remember, it also guides you in terms of uh, which sequence you need to correct the foot deformity. A bit of epidemiology. Clubfoot is basically the commonest congenital foot and ankle problem that you'll see with an incidence of one in one to two per thousand. So it's, it's very common. It's managed in pretty much most hospitals around the UK. A preponderance for males and bilateral in 50% of cases. 80% are isolated, i.e. there's no other syndromes or anything else going on, just a club foot in isolation. In terms of the etiology, it's often called idiopathic club foot because it's not entirely clear in many cases what's going on. Uh, it's it's uh, hypothesized that there might be an underlying neuromuscular or syndromic or dysmorphic problem. It might represent a primary dysplasia or arrest in fetal development. There's a strong genetic component. And as it states there, uh, you might see a familiar occurrence in 25% of cases. And this, if you remember one gene about clubfoot, PIT X1 is the one you need to think about. This is an important transcription factor in limb development. It's also observed in a number of condition, sorry, I'll go back there, a number of conditions uh, like arthrogryposis, myelodysplasia, tibial hemimelia, and so on, as listed there. And so I think that's why people think there might be an underlying neuromuscular uh, or syndromic cause, because it's present, often present and associated with these conditions. 
In terms of the pattern anatomy, so these uh, pictures illustrate what's going on to a certain extent. So you see that um, dissection specimen, you'll see a plantar, plantar flex medially um, located um, and directed talus with the navicular partially subluxed off this in a plantar flex medial direction. You can see these histology slices uh, with the normal compa comparing next to the club foot. You can see that the navicular in the club foot is almost articulating with the medial aspect of the talus. And the talus itself is also dysmorphic uh, with a shortened neck and abnormal articular surfaces. Uh, when you look at the lateral column as well, you see that the cuboid is medially displaced as well, or medially orientated. And this refers to the bony anatomy, so the osseous deformities, but there are also soft tissue issues. And these are probably more important in terms of perpetuating the deformity. So all the, uh, a lot of the ligaments um, and, and tendons are also contracted. You'll also notice that the, uh, below the knee, the, the muscular muscles will be more fibrotic, less, uh, less uh, myofibrils and generally atrophic. And there might even be issues with the vascular anatomy and in up to 45% of cases, the dorsalis pedis may be missing. So it's multifactorial here. So the bony anatomy and the soft tissues as well. In terms of the classification, you can break it down broadly into three broad groups. You've got the idiopathic club foot, which is the commonest. This is when there's an isolated club foot, nothing else going on. Syndromic club foot, uh, like this case of, in arthrogryposis, so there's also associated congenital knee dislocation and hip dislocations. And so it's a slightly different beast from the idiopathic club foot. And then uh, finally, an atypical club foot. So this is still essentially an idiopathic club foot, but it has certain features which makes it behave slightly differently from the idiopathic club foot. So firstly, the rigid, the equinus is much more rigid. Secondly, you see a shorter first ray with a hyperextended big toe, and then you get this very deep crease over the sole of the foot. And if these features are present, this will guide you in terms of how you're going to treat it, because it requires a slightly different uh, approach to casting. Some people also use the term complex club foot, but what I've noticed in the, the literature is that some people use complex club foot referring to syndromic club foot, and some use it referring to atypical club foot. So it may be best to stay away from that term. Whilst in the exam, you're never going to be asked about classifications. I think the scoring system, the Pirani, is really helpful. It's a, it's a score of basically 0 to 6. You score 3 for the hindfoot score and 3 for the midfoot score. When you're describing this exam, in the exam, just start with the basics. and It's a score of 0 to 6 then break it down and slowly go down into the sort of minutiae. But I think the examiner will get bored before you start describing all the nitty gritty of the, class, of the scoring system. But as you can see there, the three points for the hindfoot score uh, so it refers to the ankle range of movement, so the degree of equinus and whether you can feel uh, any uh, oscalsis in the heel or not, and finally relating to the posterior crease and how prominent or not it may be. And then the midfoot score, you can see there in terms of the curvature of the lateral border of the foot, in terms of the medial crease, and also the, how palpable the talus is, talus is or not. So zero is good, six is bad, and you can chart the foot's progress through its treatment using this score quite nicely. In terms of the treatment, this is a, a poster boy really for GERFT, because really, if you get it right the first time, you can really have exceptional outcomes. Uh, if you don't, it can be a disaster. So Stephen Gerrard, the most famous Englishman, I think, with club foot, and he obviously did extremely well and functioned at a very high level, and he had appropriate timely treatment. If you go down a surgical route, um, which was a more historical method of managing some of the club feet, uh, you can have this overcorrected, rigid, painful club foot because it's not been managed correctly. It probably was at the time, but now we know better. Or if you don't get a chance to manage it at all and um, it's neglected, then you can have a picture like this. Um, this girl I met a few years back who is loading on the dorsum of her foot and clearly is struggling to walk and is quite disabled as a result of this. So getting it right the first time is really important here um, because it can give you exceptional outcomes. And in terms of treatment, this is a picture of Ignacio Ponsetti, 
Uh, and this is what you're going to mention uh, in terms of treatment. So serial manipulation and casting as described by this chap. Uh, and th this is what gives us potentially with the adjunct of some minor surgical procedures, an exceptional outcome with club foot. So if Ponsetti was having an exam, uh, he was being fired. Sometimes I think he would want to talk about firstly crimp. Uh, if you get this term in, 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 in the exam, it would be useful. Um, it refers to the concertinering of the collagen fibers that you're going to have in the soft tissues, um, which then by manipulating and stretching these fibers, um, then you're getting rid of this crimp, which allows the uh, serial casting manipulation method. And in the cast, the crimp will recur to a certain extent. This allows you to stretch even further. So this is like the toe in phase of your stress train curves. Oops, sorry. Um, this is another term, so using the talus as a fulcrum. So that's what you're uh, manipulating, holding onto as you manipulate the foot. You never touch the heel and kinematic coupling. So this is uh, the relationship of the joints in the, in the midfoot and the hindfoot, which allows you to, by manipulating the midfoot, affect change, uh, sorry, manipulating the forefoot, affect change and correct deformity at joints proximal to this. In terms of the sequence of correction, firstly, we deal with the cable. So you need to elevate the first ray. And the issue here is that the foot may well look worse. And this is something you need to mention to the parents. Subsequently, you deal with the adductus and varus. Um, and this is when the kinematic coupling comes into its own. So you're correcting the midfoot and the hindfoot varus. Finally, you're just left with equinus. So you should have um, a Pirani score of three or less. And then you undertake your um, Achilles tenotomy if you can't get more than 10 degrees of passive uh, dorsiflexion and just bear in mind that you put the blade medial to the tendon and then swing the blade around laterally so you're cutting away from the neurovascular structures that's critical someone holding it under tension or you holding uh, uh, the ankle under tension so you'll feel that ping pop a cast on for a further three weeks after this bracing is critical this is really critical to a good outcome the affected side is placed at 70 degrees of external rotation, unaffected as it says there at 40 degrees. Our protocol, and I think it's pretty standard protocol, is full time for three months or 23 hours. You can take it off to clean. And then nights and naps for essentially as long as possible. If you can keep it going to four or five, that's really good. And to reiterate, this is critical to good outcome. And there's a dose response really in terms of using the uh, boots and bars and the risk of relapse and recurrence. If boots and bars are not tolerated, or you have a good budget, you can consider uh, something like this uh, ADM, this abduction dors dorsiflexion uh, mechanism, which is a unilateral brace, which um, is kind of spring loaded to give you the correction that you want. An adjunct to treatment is the tibialis transfer, tibialis anterior transfer. Uh, so this is, um, this is when you have, and this is another term that uh, Mr. Ponsetto used in his exam, dynamic supination. This is the term you can uh, report. So clinically, you might see this when they're walking as they're going to the swing phase, you see that forefoot supinating. Sometimes that can be quite hard to see. What, what I would suggest is you have the, the, the child sitting um, on, the, on the edge of the bed, get them to try and uh, dorsiflex their foot and you'll see it dorsiflex into mild supination. Um, and so this might be an indication after the age of around 30 months to transfer the uh, tibant, so you transfer it from uh, medially to the lateral cuneiform. This would be regarded as a treatment adjunct, not a failure treatment. What should we expect after Ponsetti? Well, anatomically, the foot will be slightly different. It will be shorter, narrower. The leg itself might be slightly shorter and you'll see some asymmetry of the musculature. But potentially you can have good function, exceptional function, still hitting screamers in for 40 yards um, if it's done really well. Some literature here, the classic papers, so Ponsetti's two classic papers are from 63. They're summarized together quite nicely in core in 2009. They report the good outcomes that they had in over 70% of patients. Uh, the Cooper paper reports these except, exceptional outcomes as well. But what's important here is that they had a control group and they found that their, out, their outcomes were as good as, or their foot and ankle function was as good as a control group. So that saying essentially it's normal. And then Smith et al. Uh, compared Ponsetti treatment to the historical surgical interventions for clubfoot and found that Ponsetti is superior uh, as well. If we talk about the surgical management of clubfoot, this is 
when you have resistant, persistent or relapsed club foot deformity. And with an initial relapse, it's very worthwhile trying Ponsetti again because that can work well. But when you've exhausted your casting and it's not working, then surgery at times may be necessary. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty here, but essentially it's an a la carte approach to things and you need to add in what is required to achieve the ultimate game, which is often the same game, uh, the, ultimate, the ultimate end point, which is often the same for a lot of foot and ankle surgery, but you know, a planted grade brace, braceable, comfortable foot. You need to consider your segments, your ankle and your hind foot, your midfoot and your forefoot. You can think of these as different courses in the menu and then consider the mobility of the segment. Um, this is uh, what Vince Mosca particularly talks about. So is it flexible, stiff or rigid? Because that will guide you in terms of whether you can undertake soft tissue surgery alone or whether it has to be more uh, bony. And even if, uh, if you have to resort to fusion surgery, which is really the last resort. Even if you undertake surgery, I would always recommend pre-op casting as that's likely to reduce the, the amount of surgical insult required. So that's whiz through club foot. We'll briefly talk about congenital vertical talus now. I often like starting with a good definition, and this is useful in the exam as well. Uh, congenital fixed dorsal dislocation of the navicular on the talus. This is rare, uh, and in, in, despite it only being one in 150,000, it often comes up in exams. Uh, as listed there, it's 50% bilateral, and then 50% associated with a neuromuscular disease or a syndrome, uh, preponderance for males as well. This picture is a classic uh, deformity that you get with the CVT, so the rocker bottom foot, um, the Persian slipper term is also mentioned. This diagram illustrates some of the potential problems with the underlying anatomy when you have uh, CVT. So firstly, with the dorsal dislocation of the, uh, of the navicular and essentially the rest of the the forefoot, you get contractures of the dorsal tendinous structures. But then also you, the line of action of some of the muscles changes as well. And for example, tibialis posterior can become a dorsiflexor um, and the perinea, um, perineus brevis can also become a dorsiflexor. So these are deforming forces which are going to fight whatever treatment one plans. In terms of imaging, uh, you have to bear in mind um, that the um, ossific nucleus of the navicular uh, doesn't appear initially uh, for, for a couple of years. So you can see the talus and you can also see the first ray. And these are two useful markers for guiding whether there's a, a, a CVT. You can measure various angles. One is called a Taylor axis first metatarsal bisect angle, the TAMBA. Um, and that refers to the acute angle here marked. And if it's more than 60 degrees, this might be an indication of a, a CVT or in a, dorsif, in a plant deflection view if it's more than 35 degrees, potentially. Or you can use a Miri's angle as well. In reality, often things are reasonably obvious when you're x-raying them and you don't necessarily need to draw these angles. They can be useful in terms of charting progress and casting if, if, if you so wish. What's critical is that you get a forced plant deflection and a forced dorsiflexion view. So the forced plant deflection view is to confirm that Basically, you can't relocate um, the navicular and the, and the forefoot on the talus in plantar flexion, because if you could, this would represent an oblique talus. And the forced dorsiflexion view to demonstrate that you still have marked equinus of the hind foot, as this guides you in terms of treatment as well. So in terms of the CVT treatment, you want early reduction of the talar navicular joint and correction of the equinus. This is the picture of Matt Dobbs whose technique is now very well described and used globally. This starts initially with what we call reverse Ponsetti casting. And it is essentially the reverse of Ponsetti casting in club foot. You can see here with the vertical arrow pointing up where you're applying the pressure on the talus and then you're manipulating the foot around this. And in certain circumstances, this can fully correct the deformity. But even if it does, a closed or open reduction of the tail and navicular joint with, uh, with uh, wiring is necessary and the wire stays in for about six weeks. Once you've reduced this joint, you undertake an Achilles tenotomy to improve that hind foot equinus um, I mentioned earlier. After this, bracing is useful to try and minimize the risk of uh, relapse and recurrence. So this example, this is the, um, the x-ray from earlier. So this is a six month old girl who I treated uh, earlier on this year. Um, and this is, so she had a five to six weeks of casting 
and then a mini open approach of the tail and navicular joint. You lift up the talus, you reduce the, uh, reduce the navicular onto the talus and, and then pass the wire and that stays in for six months and um, bracing afterwards and we'll see how she gets on in, in a few months to over, over, over a few years as well. But this is the first stage. We need to monitor things carefully. Dealing with relapses can be very difficult. Now we'll briefly discuss the rest. So one slide on metatarsus adductus. If you, want to um, if you want to describe the severity, you can use the black bisector and you can see this line which um, in a normal foot goes between the second and, and third rays. And you can see as the adductus gets worse, um, the line essentially shifts laterally. Essentially, you don't really want to do anything about this if you can avoid it. You certainly wouldn't do anything above the age of five. If you do have a child in clinic with metatarsus adductus, examine the hips because there is an association with DDH. Whilst it isn't a standard night guideline for hip screening, if they're in your clinic, it'd be worthwhile just examining the hips because a met metatarsal adductus is in that category of what we call packaging disorders uh, that may potentially be associated with DDH. But essentially, you don't want to do anything for the metatarsal adductus, maybe some gentle stretches. Most correct themselves over time. And even if there's residual adductus, it doesn't necessarily cause any problems. A calcaneo valgus foot, another good picture to be shown in the exam. So this is when you have a dorsiflex position of the foot when the baby's born in. The, the dorsum of the foot can actually be in contact with the shin. This is associated with the posterior medial uh, bow. So remember this. The foot deformity will improve with some gentle stretching. There might be some reduction in plantar flexion uh, objectively, but no functional problems. The main issue here to remember the exams is the residual deformity, so there might be ongoing bowing and a leg length discrepancy in maturity of, between this range. So that might require contralateral limb epiphysiodesis or lengthening depending on the magnitude. A brief comment on congenital foot deformities. If you get shown some of these pictures, there is a risk that you might panic. Uh, and to a certain extent, that's fair enough. Go back to principles. And here are some important principles. So remember your Swanson classification, your failure of formation, differentiation, duplication, overgrowth, undergrowth, constriction band syndrome, and essentially the rest. But this gives you an idea of how to describe what you see and some useful adjectives. So is it pre or post axial? So, um, is it on the medial or lateral aspect of the foot? And then all these are useful adjectives to describe what you see. Finally, this is the Franco Rahili classification, which refers to congenital limb deficiencies as a whole, but some of these terms are very useful, especially transverse deficiencies, longitudinal deficiencies, and then um, intercalary, intercalary deficiencies. So this is a useful classification to learn. So this will then hopefully give you um, a chance of describing what you see when initially you've never seen anything like it before. So just to go through uh, these pictures, so you can see the polydactyly um, on, the, on the right there, we've got a constriction band uh, syndrome with a cheeky club foot hidden um, there in the middle. And then um, this is a, a, tip, a fibula hemimelia here. So you can, you have a complex uh, syndactyly and actually a bit of, almost like an ectro, ectrodactyly because we're missing an intermediate ray. Um, and there are also coalitions there, which you can't see on that. So that's a brief comment on congenital foot deformities. So just to recap what our learning objectives were. So the plan was to really cover club foot uh, thoroughly in terms of the diagnosis, the, dis the classification, the treatment and the outcomes, a bit about congenital vertical talus and then the rest. And hopefully that will hold you in reasonable stead for the exam and I'll um, invite any questions now. Thank you. Okay, so I see a question from Justin uh, Mutaram. What is the total time in the Ponsetti casting before tenotomy? Uh, so this will vary dependent on how responsive the foot is to the Ponsetti casting, uh, but an average is five weeks. 
but you can sometimes adopt an accelerated, uh, accelerated regime if, if the foot and circumstances allow. And sometimes you may need to add a few more weeks, but five weeks on average before tonotomy. And then once you do the tonotomy, three weeks in cast thereafter. And depending on the age of the child, in three weeks, they can grow a bit. And we essentially want to start treatment as soon as possible. And they're going to grow quite rapidly in their first you know, few months of life. So we would often change their cast halfway along their three weeks, just so they don't get too tight. Graham, would you like me to continue with the, uh, the older child? No, I'm not sure if you can see me or not. Can you see me? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, we've got um, uh, another question here, Alpesh. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Um, it's the simplest description of clubfoot that I think I've ever heard. I think for those people going to the exam, that'll be really, really valuable. Um, so that was, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, you've talked about uh, the role of x-ray in congenital vertical tailors. Is there any role for it in clubfoot? So I think in general, we tend not to x-ray too much, um, but when you're surgically managing club foot, x-rays become a bit more useful. Um, and then there are various degrees to it, how in depth you can get your x-rays. And I know uh, Vince Mos Mosca, who does a lot of foot and ankle education and writes a lot about it, will do x-rays with common blocks and um, in a variety of positions, get Harris views, but essentially most departments aren't set up for that. But weight bearing x-rays would be useful to get an idea of the degree of cavus. And I think the, um, the talocalcaneal axis um, angle is quite useful to get an idea, idea of the degree of inversion uh, that you have that you need to correct. And when you're screening in theatres, it's good to know that that's improved when you do your soft tissue releases. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I've got one very uh, sort of topical question here and probably the last one for you um, at the moment. Um, Adil has written, some feet are too chubby to hold in a cast. Should the approach change for these patients? Um, well, bear in mind, we've been casting that amniotic band syndrome uh, that you saw the, the picture of and we've been doing that successfully. So I think my physios would be very upset if you said that some feet would be too chubby. They, they, I think they feel that they can achieve it, um, you know, in most cases. Essentially, you have to try. And if the cast keeps falling off or if you're not getting a correction, then you'll have to change what you do, but always try. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much, Alpesh. Um, I think we'll move on now to the second half of the evening. Um, and I shall hand you over to uh, Mr. Rick Brown. Hello, Graham. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and share my screen. Can you, um, can you see things yet? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you very much. So Alpesh and I work a, 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 together as a team and it's a trying, we're trying to develop as a model between pediatric orthopedic surgeons and the adult foot and ankle surgeons. So there'll be patients I'll pop in and see that his are 14 because inevitably they will become adult and uh, it's very, very helpful for families to have a transition. So. The transition in the talk, a story so far, we've covered these topics, club feet, CVT, metatarsis adductus, and I'm going to cover over the next 20 minutes as things that are particularly peculiar to the older child and their foot. So the accessory centres, which can cause confusion, some of the osteochondritides, overuse injuries, and then flat feet in children, both the, the flexible and the uh, rigid. So um, if we think about these small little bones, are, there are very many, they can cause confusion in trauma conferences. And then uh, I've listed them on the left. And if you look here, you can see this little extra bone at the bottom of the, uh, the uh, medial malleolus, which is the os sub tibiale, because it's below the tibia. Um, you can also get a small one, which is below the fibula, much less common. The accessory uh, navicular and the ostrigone we'll talk about in more detail. But just bear in mind that os perineum are very common indeed although they don't tend to cause trouble on children, they do can cause problems in athletes. Here's an example of confusion where you're trying to decide between whether this, this is a os sub tibiale or a fracture. And in fact, what you can have is both. There's a little fracture line 
and there's the additional, additional accessory center of ossification. In a child, um, posterior impingement can be explained by an ostrigone. And in the, what's different in a child is here you can see just the fleck of calcification because most of the ostrigone is still cartilaginous. And it's only on an MRI you might see the extent of it and explain the pain behind the ankle. But it can be other problems with, um, assess, uh, with ossification. So if the posterior process of the talus is elongated or the ostrigone, you might think of it as an ostrigone that's, that's fused to the back of the talus, you have this thing called the stider process. And this, you can see the type two increased signal around the back to illustrate the inflammation and the pain that that's producing. The accessory navicular, very common, 17 to 21% of people. And it's associated with the flat feet and the pain is very localized and uh, can, it be, can be spotted particularly well in the AP oblique x-ray. But it's often an incidental finding and not the diagnosis. Um, there are three types of accessory navicular. The uh, first one is where it's a purely, as you can see here, within the tibias posterior tendon, and these rarely give trouble. Then the troublemaker ones are the type two, where you can see the synchondrosis, which is irregular between the os and um, the uh, main navicular. And there's a third type, which uh, is where the, the uh, accessory navicular has joined together and often has a hook shape. Um, and uh, this can lead to um, bony prominences, but this is the less likely to be symptomatic. Um, how you treat this initially with uh, rest, reduced activities, shoe modification, insoles to provide support to the medial arch, exercises to strengthen tib post and the other exercises for medial stress syndrome. Occasionally we'll place uh, older children in walker boots, but younger children might need to go in short casts to, because of their compliance. And, and, and the teenager and probably the young adult, then the, the accessory navicular can be removed. The key to that is highlighted in red. That's making sure that you leave the tibias posterior nice and tight. Here's an example of me removing one. You can see the additional bones very prominent. You can see it's been removed. You can see the size of it here. And then into this area here, the tip post will have been drilled and tightened up. The osteochondritis is an inflammation or an area of damage to the epiphysis of a growing bone and here you can see the two commonest ones this is the navicular the colon colas disease and here you can have a collapse of the epiphysis in uh, in Freiburg's so in colas disease this is um, more common in boys it occurs in between four and five years of age it's quite commonly affecting both sides and the navicular is flattened and whiter is cirrhotic um, it uh, always gets better. It's a self-limiting condition. If it doesn't get better, then the concern is you might have missed the diagnosis. Freiburg's infarction is an AVN of the second metatarsal head. And this is probably due to a vascular insufficiency and in combination with the chronic overload. It's more common in females this time and uh, presents with metatarsalgia and later on it'll present uh, with stiffness and uh, arthritic changes. In the acute phase, then... Um, it's all about offloading and protecting the um, metatarsal head so there's no further damage. And then in the delayed phase or the cold phase, when it's um, be revascularized, then you have to deal with what damage has occurred, which might involve trying to rotate the remaining good cartilage back into the weight bearing area. Children love activity, but they can also you know growing skeleton, they can over use their bones and cause overuse injuries. And the two commonest in the foot and ankle are Severus condition, which is a traction apophysitis, presenting with heel pain in this young gymnast. And it's uh, very much aggravated by the activity and it's settled down by rest. The other one to remember is on the lateral side of the uh, midfoot at the proximal end of the fifth metatarsal. And that's Islin's condition, which is a traction apophysitis from the pair Nearest brevis tendon pulling at the base of the fifth metatarsal. Uh, both of these, uh, you can see the change in the apophysis. It's often a little bit uh, whiter, although that can be a normal finding. And the key thing to look for radiographically is to look for fragmentation or little micro fractures, which would su can suggest uh, damage. Like many of these things, the key is activity modification, rest, and perhaps even time in a walking boot. These will get better. Now, if we uh, Move on to the bigger topic of flat feet. 
I tend to think of things in threes, and you can think about flat feet in three groups. There's the idiopathic, the commonest, and then there's a group of three flexible and a group of three rigid. Um, so we'll go through these each in turn, but um, the most important thing is that um, in flexible flat feet, there's a hind foot valgus, there's flexible subpatial movement, and the arch corrects. So if you ask the child to stand on tiptoes, this flattened arch improves and comes back. So you can see they have all the structures required and you may consider it that effectively the body weight is overpowering the structure and the arch is collapsing, but they have the correct ligaments, joints and muscles to be able to correct the arch when they stand in tiptoes. Or you can have the foot in, across your lap and you can dorsiflex the first ray and Jack's test and you can see the arch reform with the plantar fascia. So if flexible flat feet are normal. 80% of two-year-olds will have flexible flat feet and this uh, decreased, but in Harris's famous studies in the 40s, still a significant number of Canadian army recruits had flat feet and they'd been able to walk across the vast plains of Canada to join the army and were perfectly um, well. Um, so this is effectively normal, provided it's painless and flexible. If it's pain-free, there's absolutely no need for treatment. There's a, now a well-established randomized controlled trial that showed that orthotics were no better. Whereas if it is painful, you might wish to try an orthotic. And the strongest ones of these are the UCBL inserts, which are very deep heel cups and uh, support, as well as the medial arch support. Um, if the Achilles tendon is driving this, then they need to also be, that needs to be combined with stretches. In a rare, rare case, we may proceed to surgery. Um, and um, I liked uh, earlier on Al Pesh's idea of a la carte surgery. This is another example of a la carte surgery. If you do have to operate in the rare case, you want to consider segment by segment. So you'll want to think about the Achilles tendon. Is it tight uh, with a positive silver skull test? Is it a gastroc that's tight or is it tight uh, distally and therefore would need a distal release by z length in the tendon. So think about the Achilles tendon, how that's influencing the structure. And then you can think about uh, the surgery to try and uh, improve the deformity. Uh, and to improve the deformity in children, a common way of doing that would be a lateral column lengthening, where you can see here the, the, uh, in the uh, either the anterior process of the calcaneum or in the cuboid, you can make an osteotomy and then put in a segment of iliac crest to lengthen the lateral column, which has the effect of pushing the navicular background onto the uh, tailor head and reducing the uh, tailor navicular abduction, which is associated with a severe flat foot deformity. And here's this shown uh, in one of Mosca's x-rays. You can see that here is the, the line of the anterior process. And by lengthening the lateral column, this moves up and this pushes the navicular into alignment and reduces it back onto the tailor head. But we rarely need to operate, and that there's an a la carte method of thinking how to do this. Now, it's fashionable and, and it's very popular to talk about is there a role for an arthresis screw? Um, nice guidelines, which are now a little bit out of date, said certainly not. Um, people have argue, argued that it's a mutilation surgery, you take a normal flat foot and you uh, prop it up with a little piece of plastic, and the best operation the child or young teenager has is, is the removal of that piece of plastic. However, there may be a role for this, as we become more cautious 11 years beyond the nice skyline, is to think that this might have a role in supporting your reconstructions of an, a very complex and more severe adolescent flat foot. And then the idea is that it's a temporary measure to go in, and then the family are told that it's coming out again in the future. And I just want to highlight this final subgroup of the severe flexible flat foot, which is called the skew foot. And it's important to, to look for that. You'll see distally, you'll see hallux valgus, you'll see metatarsus primaveris, and you'll see the hind foot is in, in mid, leading to the midfoot is in, in valgus. So you're looking for that serpentine or Z shape, similar um, terminology, different terminology for the same condition. So if you see this, they're important to pick up. And also it's important to realize they're going to do less well and going to need more complex surgery. So we've talked about the flexible flat foot and which is predominantly idiopathic. So if you think about these three different groups of the flexible, one is the tight tendon Achilles, 
and the treatment that's important to pick up because you can send the child off to the pediatric physios to stretch and they will nearly always do very well without the need for surgery a few might uh, and there's usually underlying neurological reasons may need to have uh, an isolated lengthening of the Achilles tendon or release of the behind the knee of the posterior uh, the proximal head of the medial gastron. The other group is the Cessary naviculus, which we've talked about before. Um, and they, as, as uh, mid-teenagers, may need surgery. And the third group is just to spot patients with hyperlaxity. They will present with uh, flexible flat feet with pain. And, and you need to recall the Baton score. Um, most examiners, even our eminent professors of hip surgery now, are fully trained to recall what the Baton score is and therefore to ask you what the Baton score is. And this allows you to quantify, to some extent, how severe the deformity is. An important thing about surgery in the patients with increased laxity is they do less well, their prognosis is bad, and they often end up, uh, if you correct a valgus deformity, there's a risk of them falling into varus, and there's a risk of them going the other direction. So like many of these things, we're really trying to uh, strengthen the secondary stabilizers and avoid the need for surgery. Right, so we've talked about uh, two out of three. Then the third is the group of rigid uh, causes of flat, flat feet. And um, I like to think about the, the biggest topic is coalition. We've talked a little about CVTs, but never forget trauma. Um, you could have a very stiff, rigid flat foot after a burn or other trauma. Tarsal coalitions are about 3% of the population. They commonly affect um, both feet. And the commonest was always thought to be calcaneal navicular. And uh, set close in the heels, boom, boom was a talocalcaneal coalition. They present with uh, hind foot pain, aggravated by activity. The pet child may have recurrent ankle sprains or just complain of stiffness in lateral hind foot pain because the subtail joint's very stiff. It used to be called perineal spastic flat foot because the muscles would be spasming and uh, uncomfortable trying to move a, a very locked joint. These are failures of separation. If you go back to that list of different uh, etiologies that Alpesh mentioned this is uh, one of the Swanson's group of the failure of separation and they can be depending on the structure in causing the coalition they can be bony cartilaginous or fibrous. The time they present depends on the ossification sequence of the foot so in the earlier child between 8 and 12 the calcaneal navicular bones are nearing, nearing the end of their secondary ossifications they, their coalitions start to become stiff whereas the talocalcaneal bones become towards the end of their secondary ossification a little bit later, so they present a bit later. There are classic x-ray signs to spot, um, and this is a uh, view of a, an anteater sign. You can see the uh, snout of the anteater, uh, it's to, which is pathognomonic of a calcaneal navicular coalition. Here you can see a C sign with the black arrows, that's pathognomonic of a talocalcaneal coalition. And uh, we used to take Harris axial views, and you can see a normal subtalar joint here. You see the irregularity, and, and something's blocking it here, in the, to which is another radiographic view of a subtalar coalition or talocalcaneal. However, we now often go to CTs and imaging, and you can see it more clearly in a similar sort of view on your advanced imaging. How do we treat them? Don't forget to try and just, if the child presents you for the first time, try and treat it non-operatively, try and get it to settle down. If it was fine before the sports injury, it's likely to be fine again. 30% will get better if you rest them in a, a cast or a walker boot. But eventually, most of them will come towards surgery if they remain active and participating in sports. Here's a simple calcaneal navicular coalition demonstrated and then removed. And you can see the big space of at least a centimeter on each side um, and you can see that that can move freely on the table. There's a debate about what you might put inside the uh, space, and that can be the fat or the neighboring EDB muscle belly. Uh, they do well, and it's said that uh, if they have a large tailor beak, which is a sign that they've had prolonged ultrabiomechanics, that that's a poor prognostic sign. Now, the totally different beast is the talocalcaneal coalition. Here's an example of one on a, a CT. And what's important about these is the size, what percentage surface area 
of the middle facet of the post, of post middle facet of the subtail joint has evolved? Has the teenager developed any degeneration? And how severe is the deformity? In essence, if it's a small one presenting early with no degeneration, then resect it. If it's an older child with more than 50% involved and there's already degeneration, then you should fuse it. Um, it's also important when you're um, deciding which to do, whether to resect, try and maintain, and gain more mobility, is to consider what the, is there a deformity. If the deformity is less than 15 degrees, the literature suggests you probably can um, watch this and manage this or not with uh, orthotics. But if it's greater than 15 degrees, you're probably obliged to do some form of realignment. And there's a whole plethora of different types of realignment. Um, but very successful are the ones we touched on before, the lateral column lengthening. But you may wish to do a sliding osteotomy of the, the, the uh, hind foot to bring it from valgus to medialize it across to the neutral axis. Um, but it's important to think about treating the, the, um, the coalition and treating the deformity. So there's an example where the arch is flattened, the Mary's line is, is collapsed, and you can see the arch has been re-established, calcaneal pitch has come up again by doing the lateral column lengthening, as well as taking away the subtalar coalition. What's new and has been uh, of interest recently is how to remove these. It's a big dissection to take these out um, by open surgery, and people have started advocating doing these by arthroscopic techniques. This team is using a posterior approach, and you can see posteriorly, you, this is where the coalition area was. You can see the very dangerous um, FHL, and what will be very near to that will be the neurovascular bundle. A little burr can get in there, and you can clear this away. That's the posterior approach. I prefer the sinus tarsi approach, because it's anterior lateral. And this time, this is one of my own ones. You, you, I was removing this coalition from the inside, and um, got a, a good clearance, um, but you can just see truth is important. You can just see a tiny little bit of metal. So it's very tricky and that's a little bite of the arthroscope has been left in there as well because it's very awkward access. But that's perhaps the word future to be able to remove these arthroscopically and then to realign the foot to provide a more mobile joint in the adolescent and to uh, correct the biomechanics for the longer term. So um, that's a whistle-stop tour, um, Graham, about uh, the, the conditions affecting the older, older uh, child's foot. Wonderful, thanks very much, Rick. Another excellent talk and a, a very comprehensive run-through of lots of paediatric things. Um, we've got a couple of questions. One, this one's interesting. Um, this is from Mr. Anonymous Attendee, um, who says, in the combined flexible flat foot and juvenile hallux valgus, what is the approach of treatment if the hallux valgus is symptomatic? So with uh, generally overall with juvenile hallux valgus, we'd really try not to operate. And, and uh, so the, the, the neutral aligned hind foot, we will do everything we can not to operate, so activity modification, insoles, and there'll be a little bit of natural hindfoot valgus, and you can correct that with a, a corrective orthotic, bring that across, and hopefully support the hallux valgus without the need to operate. However, if you've got a very severe flexible flat foot, then the whole arch collapses, and that drives the hallux into valgus. So it may be that you're, that's one of your indications to correct the hindfoot deformity. But it would be my first concern would be to deal with the hindfoot deformity, because it's a classic example of how the hindfoot can lead to problems with the forefoot. So get the hindfoot right, stack that up correctly, and you may not need to do anything to the to the hallux valgus. Perhaps you might do a um, soft tissue release, so it's a modified McBride, just to try and um, if if that's what's needed, just to rebalance the soft tissues. But very much deal with the hindfoot and try and avoid operating on the hallux itself. So thanks Rick, back to basic principles again of uh, deformity correction, start proximally and work distally. Indeed, indeed. Okay, all right. Um, another question here from Justin asking if children can get tibialis posterior tendon deficiency. They can get tibialis posterior tendon pain um, and, and tino 
synovitis inflammation around it. Obviously, there's the inflammatory groups in JCA, but that's different. Um, it's usually, it's, a, it's not a degenerative process that you see in the obese middle-aged woman working in Tesco's. That's a different disease pattern. But possibly the uh, flexible flat foot that I've just told you is, is uh, not a problem that can be ignored. The pain-free flexible flat foot in a lifetime of overactivity, that might be the precursor to what is acquired adult flat foot. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about um, with the, the past few months of lots of children sitting around being very, very idle, exercising their thumbs on a PlayStation, have you seen any increase in the number of children presenting with traction bophocytis since they've returned to school and suddenly ramped up the amount of exercise that they do? That's, that's a good question. Uh, Alpesh, what's, what's your experience? That's because in adult practice, Alpesh, we had an epidemic of stress fractures when all their mums couldn't put up with their children went running for the first time. So have you found the children running away from their parents? Uh, I, I saw four today. Uh, <laughs> wow. So, that, yeah, it seems that, and actually, you know, we try and filter them out, but some still get through. But the story's pretty classic in terms of the kids sitting around and then getting back to stuff. So... Um, yeah, yeah, they go zero to hero. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, Rick, you haven't really touched on uh, juvenile bunions very much um, in this talk. You mentioned very briefly in one of your answers there that you try very hard not to operate on um, juvenile bunions. What's your guidance for management of these? Yeah, so, so most pediatric orthopedic clinics will have a, a pediatric orthopedic physio and uh, they, will, they will see a lot more of these and they make it through to see the consultant and the, the uh, aim is to really reduce activity, make sure the footwear is corrected and uh, an insult and you're playing for time. And a, pr a practical tip I often do because the families are often very intensely worried about the bump, very intensely worried about an x-ray and the angles and things. And because you're playing for time, a little practical tip I often do is show them the vices of the of P1 and say, look, we really, really, really can operate until that's uh, healed over and closed. So they, they then watch that and watch that and watch that. And that allows them to have time. The bones get stronger, the foot gets stronger, and the, it's not, nearly always it settles down. But the other important point is when you're operating on any adolescent, if you're operating for body shape and, and cosmetic reasons, that can be a mountain of trouble. So uh, I'd be absolutely certain they've got a functional disability. Okay, all right. Um, there's a question from Amanda, who's asking, in children with Down syndrome, who have hypotonia and flat feet, uh, would it be routine practice to surgically manage the flat feet? Uh, no, no, Down syndrome with the ligaments laxity, they nearly always can cope well with the corrective uh, orthotic. Okay, I thought that would be a fairly swift answer. Um, question from Edward. What's your differential diagnosis for children who are tiptoe walkers? Uh, Alpesh, do you want to do that? Or do you want me to... Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Um, so with tiptoe walking, I think it's important to know firstly whether it's a new onset or not, and whether it's a unilateral or bilateral, um, because new, on, new, on, new onset tiptoe walking should always ring alarm bells, and you, know, you need to check the spine, um, and that there are various muscular dystrophies which can give you uh, toe walking as well. So look for that pseudo, calf pseudo hypertrophy, your Gowers test. Um, but commonly it's not, um, they just have always done that, and then it's never settled down. One thing you need to think about also is learning difficulties and behavioral problems because they uh, commonly are associated and, and might guide your management because you can improve their ankle range of motion surgically, but they may still go back up on their tiptoes. But think about the spine, think about neurology. Our general routine is that if we are considering surgery on a child, we we'll usually get a neurologist to make sure there's nothing going on. Okay, I think we've got... Just time for a couple more uh, quick questions. Um, you talked about B12 
the arthroesis screw, the screw into the subtalar joint, do you have a definite indication for when you would use that? I, um, I really don't like the idea of it. I've never really, I've never used it as a primary. There's a lot of Italian papers using it as a primary technique for flexible flat feet. Um, and I would, I use the word in my slides as mutilation surgery. That, that's, that's basically my view. But I'm beginning to come around to think that it might have a role as an adjuvant to the very severe deformities because rather than doing a very devastating subtalar fusion, um, you can prop things up in a 12, 13 year old, leave it in there for four, three or four years, and let further bone growth occur. And uh, the bones will grow in a more functional position and then you can take it out later. So I think it may have a role as an adjuvant to some of the other techniques you do with tendon transfers and bony realignment. Um, are people talking about it in the in Biscos Alpesh? They sort of ignore it. Um, I think you you highlighted that there's a real there's a, a culture in mainland Europe to use it a lot. Um, North North America and UK don't use it at all. Uh, I recently reviewed a systematic review actually about arthrosis and the the literature, like all pediatric orthopedic literature, is pretty bad. But some people report good results and. This is one for a good trial, really. Yeah, I think it'd be very good for trial, and not for simple flat feet, but the more complex ones, more severe yeah. ones. Okay. Um, there's a very quick question here. What are the chances of recurrence of uh, Severs disease, traction hypothesis, in a high-level child, for example, a dancer or an athlete? Alpesh. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm not sure. There's, I'm not sure that there's ever really recurrence. I just think it doesn't settle down, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and you'll have this sort of um, relaxing, remitting, good times, bad times, up and down. I don't think you're going to be six months, a year without anything, and then it starts up again. It's just that you'll have periods of increased activity, periods of rest. So I don't think it comes back to say. I think it just never goes fully. I agree. I, I agree. It's a, a it's a unrelenting, it, you reduce, reduce the activity, it comes back. But once the bones have calcified and become stronger, then you've gone through that phase and then it's gone forever, it doesn't come back. Okay. I think this will have to be the last question. It's quite an interesting one. Um, it's from Melanie. He says, I'm currently seeing a child who presents with what looks like club foot at the age of six. I don't know if she's a GP trainee, presumably. Um, however, mum reports that the child did not have this condition as a baby. Um, Melanie is concerned it is a neuromuscular condition. Should she therefore refer to an orthopedic specialist or a neurologist? Oh, she just said she's a, a pediatric physio. Thanks, Melanie. I would do both. Yeah. There's a high chance this is neurological. If it's unilateral, it's developing, you need to get the diagnosis. That's why you need a neurologist. And then you need someone like Alpesh to, to, to start the treatment to make it better. Yeah. Okay, well it's now nine o'clock. Um, I think we've had a great evening. Having no element of pediatric, elective pediatric work in my practice, I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, I've learned loads tonight and I think the speakers have been excellent. The quality of the talks has been very good, comprehensive, straight to the point. Um, I'd like to thank them both very much for their time um, and for maintaining the high standards of these lectures of distinction. You can always watch them back again, going to the BOFAS website, and please encourage your colleagues to uh, join in as well. We've had over 60% participants tonight, which has been um, a great turnout. So um, keep up the good work. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your questions. Um, and thank you both, Rick and Alpesh, for your contribution tonight. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, good night and see you next time.